So hi everyone, welcome to our first seminar, uh, first uh, CIC webinar for this year. And today we are having Professor Parisa Mer uh, Hodbandi here. And uh, let me give you guys a quick introduction for uh, about her first. So Professor Parisa Mer Hodbandi obtained her Bachelor of Science degree in University of British Columbia in 1998. And after that, she joined Richard Schrock School in MIT for her PhD. In 2002, then she pursued a uh, postdoc in contact with Strom uh, Brukhoff. And in 2005, she joined the faculty at the um, University of British uh, Columbia in Canada. So her research is using the power of catalysis to address environmental challenges by performing both fundamental, fundamental and applied studies. And the focus is basically on green polymers that are either derived from bio-renewable sources and are biodegradable uh, in compost in the oceans or in the human bodies. Her research interests are mainly in two different areas. Firstly is catalyst development with a special focus on control of structure function relationship. And second, on um, the uh, synthesis and characterization of new families of bio-based, biodegradable, and green polymers. So today, uh, she is going to talk about cat ionic medium in catalysis, generation of functionalized copolymers from uh, the quantity uh, monomers. So let's welcome her again and enjoy the talk. Great. Thank you very much Yun, for that beautiful introduction. Amazing pronunciation multiple times of that last name, which was done really, really well. Um, I wanted to thank everyone, especially Paula, for this wonderful invitation. And um, I want to apologize a priori because I have a pretty bad cold. And unfortunately, I will be coughing quite a few times. So I apologize for that. I'll try to not. Um, so can everybody see my Teresa, I'm going to interrupt you just for a second. Um, everyone, if you're joining, uh, please mute yourself. I actually set up the link without that. So um, especially if you're in a lab or in an office where we can hear background noise. Thank you. Go ahead. OK. Um... So I uh, want to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing and using Indium for uh, making functionalized polymers in a controlled fashion. And um, what we'd like to do generally is use commodity monomers to do this. So as opposed to really skilled polymer chemists who like to you know, build fancy monomers and, and go from there, we usually like to, to use monomers that we can buy. And so let's um, talk about that a little bit. So this area, I don't have to tell, um, <clears throat> tell this group about this importance of biodegradable material. They're useful in a broad range of applications, um, starting from the humble single-use plastic all the way to drug delivery, bioconjugation, et cetera. But I think the future is a little bit beyond that. So in terms of being able to, in two ways, one is, is to have durable, actually durable and high performance bio-based materials, not just single use plastics. And also to take some of these materials and really make them functionalized and functional as in, and to, to look at them for applications beyond against the single use plastic applications that we're thinking about. So in terms of making plastics more valuable in and of themselves. So, this is an area that we really care about. And so we have a variety of different projects in my group. Our first love is catalyst development. So I'm, I'm fundamentally uh, an inorganic chemist. I'm interested in metals. Unfortunately, well, fortunately right now, I'm interested in metal, uh, which is indium, but we, we do digress. We'll, I'll show you a little bit. If we, we, we'll move on a little bit from indium, but uh, there is a bit of an obsession going on there. I, I confess fully. Um, we're interested in polymers and in controlling polymer microstructure. So that could be tacticity, but it could be uh, polymer architecture in terms of its three-dimensionality. It could be polymer composition in terms of uh, co-polymerization. Uh, <clears throat> co and of course, incorporating functional groups, et cetera. Um, more recently, we were interested in CO2 and in terms of using, because indium is a privileged metal in this area, as, as uh, I hope I'll show you quickly. Uh, so in terms of looking at 
CO2 conversion, um, either forming cyclic carbonates or, or polycarbonates. And finally, if you're interested in actually bio-based materials, so looking at um, um, bio uh, material that are generally waste, like lignin, um, or material like cellulose, which in British Columbia, at least, there's still companies making phone books. Don't don't uh, don't tell me if it asks me why. But so instead of using phone books, can we use cellulose to generate electronics, for example? So unfortunately, last area of research is not one that I'm going to tell you about, but I'll tell you about the other three um, and you'll get a little bit of a feel of what we do. So just a very quick background on the, the kind of trajectory of our research. We start, in my very first independent paper was in 2008, where we reported these asymmetrically bridged indium complexes that were really kind of amazing for ring opening polymerization of cyclic esters. And then they were the very first indium complexes for lactide polymerization. There was only one other instance, which is this guy, for caprolactone polymerization. Since our first, um, uh, report, there have been quite a number of indium-3 complexes. This is just a tiny example of people using indium-3 now for a lot of different catalytic uh, applications. And it's it's really been shown that although the organic chemists knew that indium-3 was a really good catalyst for a lot of different or dif uh, substrate for different uh, transformations because of its water and air stability, I think uh, the catalysis field has really caught on, which I think is really, which is really wonderful. So just a quick <clears throat> highlights of this first system. So it's a strange asymmetrically bridged indium complex, a chloroethoxy indium complex that can polymerize lactide in a very controlled fashion, high molecular weights, low molecular weight distribution, very controlled polymerizations. It can handle other monomers like beta-lactone, as well, caprolactone, et cetera. But it can it can carry out polymerizations in, in the game, very controlled living manner. So you can add a monomer, watch it polymerize, add another monomer, et cetera, and be able to control the polymer molecular weight. Um, we were interested in why this system works the way it does. And so without going into any of it, we explored a huge number of different catalyst variations and understood that for these indium-3 complexes, the thing that makes them tick is being able to control aggregation in indium-3 catalysis. So if you have indium-3 complexes with the wrong ligand design, you don't have a, a controlled system for aggregation and this the catalyst won't work. So I'll tell you about this final um, ligand in the series, which is this <clears throat> uh, basically uh, uh, diphenoxydiamine uh, system, a protonated CLN, uh, let's say. And um, this catalyst is a chlorohydroxy bridged compound, which is completely air and moisture uh, stable in Vancouver air. We can take this catalyst in neat lactide with a solid triol, so everything is underneath conditions, and in air carry out very controlled polymerization of lactide. Here I'm just adding two different enantiomers of lactide, L and D lactide, and we were able to, in a very controlled fashion, generate these triarmed <clears throat> polymers. And um, again, what, what I love about this is no glove box necessary. This is all just done in a reactor in air. We just take it off after two hours, add more monomer, put on the lid and away we go. And this wonderful example in comparison with the air. So entry two is the, are the results that we got with air in air and entry three is under nitrogen. And entry three works a little bit better than entry two, but still it's a, it's a really controlled system and it shows you why I think hopefully why uh, we are so interested in indium as a metal in these kinds of systems. Um, we then switched to trying to explore cationic indium complexes. And when we looked in the literature for cationic indium, there were quite a few examples of them as curiosities, right? People synthesizing them, getting structures of them. There really weren't any examples of cationic indium in polymerization uh, reactions. And June actually, during COVID, wrote this really nice review article where he looked at the entirety of cationic indium. And there were examples in, in annulation, other kinds of organic reactions. There weren't any for cationic <clears throat> polymerization reactions with indium until our work. So this is what I'm going to tell you about four stories involving 
cationic indium. One of them isn't really cationic indium, but, but we'll just pretend it is. So the first one is the coupling of epoxide and lactones in situ to form these spiroorthoesters, which can then be polymerized in situ to give perfectly alternating polyester uh, alt ether. Um, using cationic indium complexes to generate high molecular weight cyclic um, cyclic PLA, which is quite unusual. The coupling of epoxides and CO2 to form cyclic carbonates. This is not really an in the cationic system, but it actually requires um, indium. I'll, we'll talk about that. And then finally, the coupling of lactide and cyclic ethers, a variety of them to form either block or randomly incorporated poly. <clears throat> ester ethers. And so we will uh, talk about these as well. So let's start with the first one. And um, just to kind of tell you about the way that we make our cationic indium complexes and cationic indium complexes and their nature in general. So um, the, the, we make our alkyl complexes through an alkane elimination reaction, and we make our cations usually through a protonation of one of these alkyl groups. So <clears throat> We can change um, the the nature of the counter ion um, depending on which counter ion we use with our acid. Um, and I want to show you a really interesting crystal structure here of uh, a ligand. So this ligand is 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 just a diaminophenolate um, uh, ligand. And so the counter ion here is perfluorotetraphenyl borate. And we were able to do this reaction in THF. And when when if you're thinking about doing similar reactions, say with an early transition metal cation in THF, there is no way you would be able to isolate something like this because the indium would be nucleophilic enough to, um, sorry, electrophilic enough to coordinate a THF molecule. And in this case, we are actually able to isolate a um, from THF, a THF-free um, indium alkyl compound. Can you please mute yourself, Hashim? Thank you. <laughs> with, with a coordinated um, with a coordinated counter ion. Um, so this is one of the weird things about these indium complexes. The other one, as I told you, is the fact that they're relatively air and water stable. And we, we saw that because when we were trying to isolate this particular compound, which is basically a diaminophenolate, uh, this is a THF coordinated and an alkyl cation. We also, before we could isolate this, we isolated this. This is a complex where adventitious water has been introduced. And the water, instead of reacting with this indium alkyl group, actually just coordinates to the metal and just sits there happily. And so this tells you something about the, the relative reactivity of this indium carbon bond um, to acids. And this becomes important when we're thinking about the mechanism of these reactions. I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, Hutan especially has been quite instrumental in helping us with that. Okay, so we um, also changed the ligand slightly to an imine analog, same chemistry. When we have an imine though, so when we go from an amine to an imine, we really do change the acidity of the indium center quite a bit. And now the ether will stick. So these, these complexes all have a diethyl ether coordinated, there it is. So this is, a, this is probably the only detailed synthetic slide I'll talk about. All the other cations are synthesized similarly, so you'll... Uh, Hopefully you can go along with that. Okay, so what do these things do? So we first isolated them. They were first isolated by former student Insin Yu, and then Jun uh, Jung took over the project. And so we looked at these complexes and we knew that right away, they're not catalysts for lactide polymerization. Immediately, they were not polymerizing lactide. They were not polymerizing um, epoxides. And this is kind of sad because generally epoxides are polymerized by cations, not with by these. Um, they do polymerize caprolactone, but extremely slowly. And caprolactone is generally a monomer that is polymerized quite rapidly by all kinds of Lewis acids, but not by these ones. And so this was quite unusual. But what June found was that these compounds actually couple epoxides and <clears throat> caprolactone in this case 
to form these spiral orthoesters. So what we can, what, what, because we, we don't have any control over the regio or stereo selectivity, we get a mixture of diastereomers. And um, I'm just gonna assume that you guys remember that from now on, I'm not, I won't mention it again. We can't control that very much. So, but we do get just 100% coupling. And this is really unusual because this reaction can be catalyzed by all kinds of Lewis acids. So here's a very, um, very uh, representative example with BF3, where an epoxide and caprolactone are one-to-one, -one, are reacted with each other. And in this reaction, um, there, first of all, not all of the caprolactone is consumed, all of the epoxide is consumed. We get about 40% of the spiroorthoesters, but we also get polyether and polycarb uh, polyester because this is a Lewis acid. A Lewis acid is gonna polymerize everything. And so, the, the fact that we get spiroorthoester is not surprising. The fact that we get only spiroorthoester is surprising. So that is a really important function of our catalyst system. And the difference here is really striking where in, in our case, we get full conversion of both monomers. We don't get any polyether. We don't get any polyester. We only get the spiroorthoester. So that's quite unusual. Um, June then looked at this and said, okay, let's see what else can we do. And so this is the world's smallest group of representative reactions. I showed this to organic chemists and like, that's all you did? What? Um, but, you know, we, we, we can play around with the size of the lactone. So we have seven, six, and five-membered lactones and they work fine. And then we just stay with the seven-membered lactone and we play around with different functional groups. <clears throat> and... We were interested in functionalized ones so that we can we can then react these things further and they seem to be working out fine. And when um, we use a very bulky one, when we favor a reaction on one side of the epoxide to the other, then we get only one single diastereomer. So um, this was really interesting, the fact that we can really expand it to this level. Then what can we do with them? So that's the question, right? And we know that we can polymerize them. There are this really uh, interesting uh, example of expanding monomers. So usually when you have a monomer and you polymerize it, the, the, the final product is shrinks, right? Because if thinking about monomer molecules and there's a lot of space beside them, and then if they, you polymerize them, they get closer together. So the whole volume of the material will shrink. In this case, these are, polymers that because the monomer is actually expanding, the, the polymer expands, so they have some applications. But what's what was kind of sad about the literature data was that when you take these and you take the Lewis acid and you polymerize, you try to polymerize them, this <clears throat> ring opens first, you get the mono ring opens uh, product with pretty large dispersity. And then when you heat this up quite a bit, then it, you can polymerize the second ring, it's harder, but now you're getting really low molecular rates with quite broad dispersity, and you're getting a mixture of the mono and the bis polymerized <clears throat> uh, species. In the case of June, what he was able to show is that this whole thing goes 100% to the polymer. And again, I show you both of them to show that because we start with a mixture of diastereomers, we're, we're going to get a mixture of different products, but at the, in terms of which, uh, in terms of the regiochemistry, but that's irrelevant because at the end of the day, we have a polyester, polyether material with relatively high molecular weight. And since then, and this is not in the paper, we, we have systems that can go up to more than 100,000 uh, <clears throat> grams per mole. So this then, um, the fact that we can make the monomers and polymerize them with the same catalyst under different conditions made June go, huh, okay, so why don't we just do everything in one pot? And this is what he did. He did the reaction where he did the monomer synthesis at a certain temperature, jacked up the temperature and polymerized it at a higher temperature. And that's what he did. And he was able to do this reaction without having to isolate and purify this monomer and was able to generate these catalyst, these, um, these polymers here. And depending on the molecular weight, he can actually then cross link them, play around with that. And this is something that, that is ongoing in the group. We're ex interested in what other functionality we can incorporate here, what we can do with cross linking. There's a whole uh, study going on about how to understand the mechanism of this reaction. And uh, that's, that's going to be coming up. Okay, so that's the first story. 
The second one is about these cyclic PLAs. And so let's let's delve into how we get to those uh, quickly. So we were interested in understanding the idea of that ligand around the indium. So one of the issues that we were interested in exploring is hemilability. So can we start tuning reactivity on these cationic indium complexes by adding, by adding a group? So if you remember, this catalyst has this THF coordinated. So that THF is a solvent that comes in and out, is important in the reactivity. And we wanted to actually control that by having that be a hemilabile arm. And so these are important because they can control the, the, the coordination and decomposition of reactions. They can control reactivity. So in terms of being able to control transition state uh, energies, and they can change reactivity. And I'm going to show you how we can do all of this with these kinds of uh, ligands. There's really, be, prior to this work, there wasn't uh, um, examples of any indium complexes with hemilabile arms, with the exception of this one by Mountford, which didn't really show any uh, reactivity. And I, I'm just looking at the structure now, I can see why it wouldn't show reactivity, because you'll see um, in our system what does give reactivity. So. This is a work by Chatura and uh, Hutan at the time who uh, worked on, on developing these complexes. Um, again, dialkyls, protonating them off, generating cations. And four of them were developed with different um, donor groups, sulfur, oxygen, and nitrogen, in this case, a pyridine, and then one without a donor group as to kind of uh, show the 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 ster to mimic the steric bulk of the others without having a donor group and <clears throat> um solid state structure etc so one of the things that 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 uh that Chatura and Hutan were interested in looking at is this idea of hemilability and so how can we look at this um the furan the the furfural species was the one that that they that showed the kind of most tunable behavior because what they were able to show with this species is that when you're looking at the variable temperature and MR spectra for this thing, as you go higher, this peak here, this proton with the star starts shifting quite a bit all the way up to free ligand at this point at 125 degrees C, but reversibly could come back down to 25 degrees. So this was reversible fluxional behavior. In contrast, for the sulfur donor, this was irreversible. So we saw decomposition when we went up to 105. You can clearly see decomposition in the system. And for the in the case of the pyridol, um, we very much didn't see any kind of change. So this was very much a rock in our case. And uh, Chatura likes to call this guy the Goldilocks catalyst. So I'm going to make sure to 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 uh, include that just as a give him a heads up. Um, he then looked at the stability of these complexes. So in, in uh, comparison with each other, what obviously the pyridine one is going to be, it was stable under inert conditions. It was stable in air, actually. It's quite a rock versus the species that didn't have a donor was it, it decomposed immediately, was synthesized at minus 30 degrees and just characterized under those conditions. So there really was a, a difference in the stability of the system depending on the donor group that was added. Um, <laughs> there are videos that are shown of these reactions, which I am not, I'm choosing not to show here, but suffice it to say that for complexes 2A and 2B, these guys, the furan and the, <clears throat> and the, and the thiophene uh, analogs, when the reaction was carried out and their need conditions at room temperature, this is quite an explosive reaction. So the, the video would show you this material kind of getting all over the place in the glove box. This was done without the students telling me. However, there's video evidence of them having done it. So that's lovely. Um, but in contrast, the pyridine species is actually really controlled. So, so thinking about the, the cyclohexene oxide polymerization, this is actually quite a reactive monomer. So the fact that this pyridine complex is probably one of the world's least reactive catalyst to our cyclohexene oxide was quite unusual, actually, for us. Again, we thought, OK, so this is under neat conditions. What about if we dilute the system? Same. 
the same thing happens. Sulfur and oxygen analogs here, highly reactive. Um, the cyclohexene oxide system with a pyridine donor, very controlled, stayed, relaxed system seems to, to eventually polymerize, takes its time. So um, these were fine. This is not really, it just shows you something about the catalyst. What was unusual though, was the polymerization of lactide. So when, when uh, we attempted the polymerization of lactide, neither the sulfur or oxygen donor gave us any kind of reactivity for lactide that was, that was discernible or important. However, the pyridine compound, which remember was much slower for epoxides, gave us reactivity for lactide and it gave us relatively controlled reactivity and high molecular rates with relatively low initiation efficiency, but still quite high molecular rates and good dispersity. And so we thought, huh, so what exactly is this material? Um, and what, what Chichuro finally found was that this was actually cyclic polylactic acid. So we can tell that by looking at the moldy <clears throat> analysis of low molecular weight material, where you can clearly see that you have cyclic material and open material that's been ring opened by the acid in the moldy matrix that we're using. We can also very importantly look at this plot, which is like comparing the viscosity of these material, <coughs> the ratio of intrinsic viscosity between the linear polymer and cyclic polymer. And you can see that the cyclic polymer is about um, 75% of the li linear one. And this matches a literature values for cyclic PLA. So clearly in this system, we were generating cyclic PLA. And this is actually relatively rare. There are systems that do make cyclic PLA, but they're not, they don't in general, don't give you very high molecular weight materials. So prior to that, right around when we were ready to submit our paper, Arnold and Williams published this one for, a cerium complex for making high molecular weight uh, cyclic PLA. And interestingly, it be actually the mechanism is very similar to ours. So, so this, our paper was also published in 2022. And what, what Chitura was able to show <coughs> is that these catalyst systems can actually generate very high molecular weight polymer with high initiation efficiencies and low dispersities. Um, um, and these are all cyclic polymers. And so um, this, was a, this was a really interesting system, uh, quite unique. And so we were interested in the mechanism. So how do we get cyclic PLA out of these, out of these catalysts? The first thing that we were able to see is something kind of unusual. So what, what Chatura was able to observe was actually the NMR spectrum of a lactide molecule coordinated to indium in this system. So what, what <clears throat> what he was able to show is he has the system at 100 degrees. You can see that there is a peak here for lactide after heating, after taking this and heating it in lactide for 12 hours, we can actually see a, a, a new species, which is this one, coordinating to the indium center. Um, if you bring it back down to room temperature, it's gone. If you reheat it, it, it shows back up. In the, in the same time, there's some polymer generated. And we think that that's what's happening. So this is a very stable system. But if you heat the crap out of it at 100 degrees, you're going to be able to form the lactyl species. And then once that forms, the first thing that can happen is the attack of the pyridine on the lactide. And once this forms, then we have an indium alkoxide, which I have shown you earlier that indium alkoxides in our system are very good catalysts for lactide polymerization. So what this looks like is exactly that. It takes a while for us to actually coordinate the lactide. As soon as the lactide is coordinated, there is an attack and then polymerization takes off. We can see that after a while, if you have really high, if you add a lot of lactide, so with high additions of high equivalents of lactide, we have much higher initiation efficiencies because at, at some point we really saturate the system and make this, which is the slow step of the reaction go. Um, we show that actually using VTNA that this system is zeroth or pseudo zeroth order pseudo zeroth order in catalyst. And I'll explain to you why that would be, but it's first order in lactide. So 
<laughs> this um, allowed us to come to a kind of conclusion about the mechanism. So the, the slowest part and the part that takes a long time, a lot of energy, is this addition of the lactide. Actually displacing the pyridine takes a lot. Once the lactide is coordinated, the pyridine can attack. It's not a very good nucleophile, but it is known that pyridine, can, pyridine itself can polymerize lactide. Not very well, but it does. But as soon as you have this very first attack and formation of this alkoxide, the alkoxide is a very good catalyst for lactide polymerization. And under the reaction conditions, which is 100 degrees Celsius, this is going to take off, right? And once this, this once basically you deplete most of your lactide, then you have a possibility for a chain termination event in this case. And the chain termination event is in tromolecular, which leads to the cyclic PLA being formed. And because this is so fast, the chain termination happens slower than the, the insertion. And so what we're going to get is relatively low dispersities with relatively controlled molecular weights in this system, giving us this really high uh, molecular weight material. And the more lactide we add, the better the, the control in our system is. So this was a really cool uh, um, part of this. <clears throat> and um, to uh, so so the final part of the 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 story is looking at the copolymerization of oh sorry no two two more stories um, the next one is the copolymerization of epoxide and and CO two I think it was polycarbonates so this one is actually not a cationic indium but I'll I'll show you why that becomes relevant so generally when you take an epoxide and a CO two um, the, the three possible reactions that can happen in the system, and very often all three happen, is you can form a cyclic carbonate, polycarbonate, or polyether. And the trick here is to be able to control either forming cyclic carbonate or forming polycarbonate. And polycarbonate is actually harder. Forming cyclic carbonate is quite easy, actually. And polyether, I showed you. You can form relatively easily. So the mechanism here is basically taking whatever metal source that you have, coordinating the epoxide in nucleophilic attack, an external nucleophile or a nucleophile that's bound to the metal to ring open the epoxide, attack of this, uh, the co <clears throat> coordination and, and attack of the, uh, the CO2, and either an intramolecular attack to give a cyclic carbonate or um, an intermolecular reaction with addition of another epoxide and another CO2 to form a polycarbonate. And the key to this is to be able to control going this way or going this way. And um, there are quite a number of <clears throat> group 13 complexes that have been reported to be able to do this. And of course, Derensburg has worked really early on to try to control this reaction um, for um, other uh, transition metals. And there's a lot of people that have done this, but for group 13, this is what we have um, in terms of what people have done in the field. And so my student Hassan was interested in exploring indium, but he was interested in, 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 in using this idea of hemilability with these indium complexes to tune this steric hindrance and have some extra donating ability and uh, most importantly for him to be able to use phosphorus and MR spectroscopy as a as a tool to try to understand what's going on in his systems. And um, he rebelled and decided, OK, I'm not just going to work with indium, but I'm going to work with all of the group 13 to look at a comparison. OK, fine, fine. Um, so he was able to isolate all of these compounds. And what he was able to show is interestingly that <clears throat> um, for the aluminum system in the solid state, the phosphorus coordinates, the gallium it doesn't, the indium it does. But when you're looking at in solution, it, it really is clear that aluminum and gallium, the phosphorus is not coordinated in solution, but in solution for indium, the phosphorus is coordinated. And that is really important in the catalytic uh, discussion that I'm going to talk about. So when, when, Hassan, uh, when Hassan compared these complexes, he saw that in the absence of a, an external nucleophile, nothing happens. So they're, they're not active in the absence of, an, of a nucleophile. But when you do add a nucleophile, in this case, um, 
tetrabutyl ammonium azide, he was able to get reactivity with aluminum, gallium, and indium. But indium was very much more selective, both more reactive and more selective for polycarbonate, which is what he wanted to work with. He played around with the reaction conditions a little bit more to get to really increase his polycarbonate uh, selectivity in these cases. And what he was able to show is that comparing this to indium chloride, the ligand does do something. So this is always really important to compare because uh, Hassan's first project was just using simply indium bromide and tetrabutyl ammonium for cyclic carbonate formation, which is not something I'm talking about here. But there, ligands don't do anything. Just indium tribromide itself is an excellent catalyst for cyclic carbonate formation. So for us, we are a little bit paranoid. It's like, does the ligand even doing anything? And in this case, it absolutely is doing something. So let's think about what it is that the indium is doing. So remember that I said that we need tetrabutyl ammonium azide as the nucleophile to get this reaction to work. And so let's say that the first hypothesis is that we need to have the azide coordinate to the metal. Is this something that's happening in this system? And in fact, it is. So when tetrabutyl ammonium azide is, is added to the system, in the case of the indium, I said earlier that the phosphine was coordinated. And in this case, the azide seems to be popping, the, is helping pop that phosphine off. The azide can coordinate, and we can see that as we add more azide to this. <clears throat> uh, we can see it pop off. So here we have two equivalents of azide. It's absolutely off. Here we have um, half an equal one that's clearly in, in between. And this here is one to one azide. And when we look at what this broad mixture of things is, there's definitely something going on here where the azide is coming off and on and forming various different species. Um, we then wanted to compare this process and the reactivity here of the azide attacking the epoxide for all three metals. So this is aluminum, this is gallium, and this is indium. And for all three, the same thing is happening. The epoxide is coordinating, the azide is attacking, forming this new species. And you can see that in the, in the IR spectra. But I just want you to, I want to show you this peak here, which is really important. So this is the formation of this new species here. The same thing happens for all three, aluminum, gallium, and indium. That's the first step. But the difference between them is for these two, it happens in three hours. So for aluminum and gallium, this is much slower. For indium, it happens in 10 minutes. So this reaction to me, this, this part of it shows you the importance of having that difference in the metal here. This first step happens in 10 minutes versus three hours for indium versus aluminum and gallium. So, <laughs> in general, then, the, the, the mechanism, we believe, is the very first step <clears throat> involves the dissociation of the coordinated phosphine, attack of the azide, um, and <clears throat> um, this, this then generates kind of a mixture of different either external azide or internal azide because they mix the, 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 the azide and the chlorides. Um, epoxide will coordinate. There's an attack either inter or intramolecular on the coordinated azide. There's a ring opening event. CO2 will coordinate and, um, and, uh, and um, clearly in this case, we don't get an intramolecular reaction. We get an intermolecular reaction and uh, the, there is the polymer formation at the end. We definitely need to improve on this system though, because I think that the, the molecular weights that we're getting are not, there. there's clearly chain termination in this case. So we need, to, we need to understand that. But I think this was very cool in terms of uh, the metal uh, reactivity. And finally, this, this last uh, story is this uh, being able to copolymerize lactide in cyclic ethers. And in this case, um, not just epoxide, but different kinds of cyclic ethers, and we can form both block copolymers and um, and um, uh, statistical copolymers. So again, we're interested in cationic uh, group thirteen complexes. In this case, there weren't really any indium ones; they're aluminum ones, and they do react. They they give you generally low molecular weight material. There's some high molecular weight uh, systems. This is being one of the better ones uh, in terms of giving us really high molecular weight material with aluminum. 
Um, and we were we were interested to see whether the the Indian versions of things, systems like this would would give us uh, the kinds of reactivity we were hoping for 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 these these kinds of epoxy polymerization. So my student Carlos uh, generated aluminum com uh, indium complexes, um, a number of them, where basically you have different solvent systems. Uh, so so all of these complexes are isostructural. So let's just look at the structure. They basically have the ligand in the plane and different solvents uh, in the axial positions and different counterions. And they're all basically um, isostructural, the NMR spectra look the same. So Carlos was able to show that depending on what the counterion is, in this case, he compared uh, uh, <clears throat> hexaphenylphosphine, um, hexaphenyl uh, phosphate, arsenate, and antimonate. And he was able to show that the antimonate definitely gives higher conversion really because it doesn't decompose. The arsenate and the phosphate decompose. Specifically, what happens to them, I think, is fluorine transfer onto the metal, but let's not go there. Um, and he also showed that it's very much solvent dependent. So if the solvent is a, is a donor solvent, it shuts down the reaction. Um, and this has to do with the fact that, that um, it matters what these solvents are in the axial position. If he has a really good donor, it changes the reactivity. Um, so if he has a, a, um, a uh, solvent molecule that will dissociate faster, the reaction goes faster. If one that coordinates stronger, the reaction is slower. So that, that uh, makes sense. And then he was able to show um, that um, for a number of different epoxides, this catalyst was uh, excellent for forming uh, polyethers, he was able to show that he can homopolymerize a number of different uh, um, cyclic um, ethers and copolymerize epoxides in these ethers <clears throat> to generate these mixture of different polyethers with variety of different structures. And this is actually really interesting if you can do it in a controlled fashion, which Carlos can, because if you think about polyethers, they're used in a lot of different um, pharmaceutical applications as a water soluble component, uh, like PEG, for example, is used as a water soluble component of these polymers. And so being able to tune that can get really interesting for a lot of different people uh, that are interested in this area. Um, he was able to then look at the, the, uh, the nature of these polymers and the dozy, for example, the dozy and the DSC show that these are very much random copolymers. So you see one peak in the dozy, and one uh, one uh, one uh, one rise in the the DSC. So clearly, one polymer, and these are random copolymers, and that's actually shown from the the GPC as well. So then, what uh, what Carlos did was change the nature of the catalyst. So what he was able to do is just subtly change this. So he changed it from the hexafluoroantimonate to bar. So change the nature of the counter ion. And now you have a very large, um, you know, hexafluorantimonate is large, but perfluorotetraphenyl borate is really large. And so in this case, what he was able to do is something quite different. He was able to actually carry out the block copolymerization of epoxide and lactide. And this is really cool because this he's able to change the mechanism of the system for each of the monomers. So if you see, and you can see that they're block copolymers just really quickly um, by looking at the DSC, et cetera, you can see the two different peaks. And what's really cool is that <clears throat> he's seeing um, a, a um, iso rich polymer, which is what we would expect with the, uh, the kind of ligand system that we have. And um, he's able to show that he can make these block copolymers with various epoxides and lactide, and he can control the molecular weight of these systems. So he, he takes the epoxide, he polymerizes the reaction. Then he can add triphenylphosphine, and I'll show you what that does. And then he can add lactide, he can control these blocks. And so what, what's happening in this situation is that he's got a cationic system. We start with the cationic indium complex. He adds the epoxide. There's a cationic polymerization of epoxide. And this is what the chain end looks like. And the nature of the anion matters because that's what stabilizes the cation. 
So once this is once he's ready to finish this reaction, he adds the triphenylphosphine. The triphenylphosphine basically neutralizes the chain end here. So now all we end up with is a cationic, uh, sorry, is a neutral indium complex alkoxide, which we know is a really good catalyst for lactide polymerization, which then goes ahead and polymerizes the lactide and it allows us to get this beautiful controlled glucopolymers, which um, also Carlos was able to show that he can actually tune the, the physical properties of these polymers, like their <clears throat> Young's modulus uh, and their rheology, depending on what the different components are. So with that, and since my voice is about to die, I'm going to conclude, and I hope that I have shown you that indium complexes and cationic indium complexes in particular are really versatile catalyst for polymerization that we can really use them to control um, the composition of catalysts that we can play around with the with the you know different blocks different molecular rates we can we can really tune and control polymer uh, polymer functionality with these. We can form high molecular weight cyclic polylactic acid, which is a very unusual and uh, and um, um, and high molecular weight PLA in particular is, is relatively unknown. Um, we can generate a, a copolymers of CO2 and epoxide. And then I showed you that we can really tune this reactivity by what the donors are. So you can eat, so, so you can really have a very fine tuning of the reactivity of these indium complexes by subtly changing the ligand design from an amine to an imine, for example, or by adding different solvents or by tuning it by changing the hemilabial arms around it and really drastically tuning the reactivity of the catalyst. So with that, I want to thank my group. I put an older group just to show you uh, what uh, older group picture. Um, actually, it doesn't have Bhutan in this one. This is June um, a while ago. And uh, so I, I, uh, this work was the work of quite a number of people. What the major people I've, I've talked about uh, were June and Bhutan, as well as <clears throat> Chatura and Hassan and Carlos. And, um, also, thank you to my collaborators uh, at UBC, Savas Hatsikirikas, who's been working with me on uh, the, the rheology and chemical engineering of, of a lot of these things, and Paula, especially over the years. Um, and I've, I've had support from a number of different, uh, number of different sources, um, but the most important, I think, for us has been NSERC, which, which has in a variety of different you know, named programs has supported us. And again, thank you to my students. Thank you very much to you for your invitation. And I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, let's start with questions from the students. So if you have any questions, you can just unmute yourself or uh, raise your hand on Zoom. Uh, hi, Farisa. Hello. <laughs> uh, a quick question came in my mind um, for Carlos's work, where he yeah. tried different uh, counter ions. Mm -hmm. uh, it is also, I think, possible to control how well the ions interact based on the solvent. So, for example, a nonpolar solvent would make them closer together, and a polar further away. Was there any exploration of solvent effect on the same ion? Yeah, so, so remember that for for that system. So let me let me share my screen again. Um, we the, the thing that really mattered in terms of reactivity because the very first I know that I sped through this, but the very first um, the very first thing that needed to happen was a solvent coming off, right? So there's definitely whatever we put in there. So if it was a, it was a strong donor, so if you put something like acetonitrile in there, it just shut down the reactivity, right? So, and if you put something that's too much of a donor, so if you can tune very much what that, that group would be, um, it would really affect the rate of reaction. So he did play around with it quite a bit, but it was more about thinking about the donor ability of the group. Um, and depending on what, if you had a, an 
anion that could actually coordinate, like triflate would actually coordinate up here. So it depend, it very much depended on those positions because this is a quite a Lewis acidic compared to the earlier June stuff. This is this is quite much more Lewis acidic. So this catalyst system would not be able to do the the SOE reaction because it's it's much hotter. If that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> I had a quick question um, on the pyridine uh, like contribution to the mechanism that you showed. Does the thiophene and the furan also contribute, or is so it just the the pyridine? So you're talking about the cyclic PLA work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean here. Yeah. That one? Um. Mm -hmm. So, so um, in in this in this case, um, what what he what um, what Tutura was able to show was that actually these guys don't at all polymerize lactide. So I think that that uh, they they're they're not very active. So they're they're for sure not going to be even if this was this this happening, they're not going to be nucleophilic enough to do this. Right, this attack requires something that's but a bit more nucleophilic, I think. Um, so yeah, that's probably why it's, it's it's why, for example, you can do lactide polymerization in THF, and but THF itself will not polymerize lactide versus pyridine will polymerize lactide under these conditions. Like if you heat pyridine up to 100 degrees in, with lactide, just pyridine in, in, in lactide, it will polymerize. So I think that has to, that's, that's what it has to do with it. It's just that, in our case, it takes such a long time for this thing to dissociate that once it does and it attacks, then this thing takes off. Yeah, okay, super cool. I actually have the same question on uh, that, a similar question on that part. So uh, you were talking about the polymerization for caprolactone and yeah. did you say the, uh, the, the pyridine structure is also the most active and why is that most active is there any like oh with the caprolactone polarization caprolactone so you mean here Capri no the uh same the same structure i think the on the second part mm. you mean here I guess I might uh, miss that part, but so did you do like any other monomers with Yeah, no, we didn't or? we didn't work. So when we worked all of our work with caprolactone involved copolymerizing it with epoxide. So in this case, I think if you're if you're referring to the only system in which the pyridine is actually more reactive, it's this one, right? So and it has to do with the fact that I think for this particular reaction, um I think it has to do with the nucleophilicity of the of the of the pyridine, but but uh, that's that's just my best bet in terms of its being because there's no other in these catalysts. If you look at them, there really is no other nucleophile. I guess you can think about this being a nucleophile, but it's just too closely bound to the indium. So when you're thinking about the polymerization of these rings, they coordinate to the metal, and then you need then to have a nucleophile attack. And so in that case, I don't really, you know, this poor system doesn't really have too many good choices, right? It, it's, it's, if you look at this thing, um, once this coordinates, the only thing that could really attack it is the alkyl, but I showed you how completely unreactive that alkyl is. It doesn't want to do anything, right? Remember it, the water compound, it doesn't want to do anything. This is very much strongly bound to the indium, so that's not going to do anything. So the only thing that's possible for this thing to, to attack the coordinated lactide is the pyridine, and the pyridine is just more nucleophilic than the, than the furan and the, the thiophene. I think I think that's that's my hypothesis currently. Maybe I'll make Hutan do a, <laughs> do, do a study of it. <laughs> Yet another one. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. So uh, if there is no other questions from the students, I guess uh, we can open the floor to professors. So if you, any professors have any questions, you can just ask yourself.
Hey, Parissa, great talk. Thanks. Um, I was really interested in that Indian water complex because it's got that yeah. alkyl group. I was wondering, did that come from just adding a little bit of water or was that in neat water? Oh, no, no. That was just us uh, trying to crystallize this thing out. So oh, we, I see. This was, this was adventitious water. It was just a very strange thing because we know that these things are air and moisture stable, right? Remember that we can just keep these, cat like these mm -hmm. pyridine versions of this, like these guys, um, where are they? Uh, these things, where are they? Sorry. This thing is like, this is a cationic indium complex that's stable to Vancouver air, right? So that kind of tells you that whatever that reaction with that coordinated, even if water cord is, first of all, so indium can be very easily nine coordinate, right? It, it, it has a really large uh, coordination sphere. So even if the water is coordinating, it's not gonna be reacting at any sort of kinetically reasonable time scale. So I, I think that's probably what's happening with these things. I think that when you expose them to air, the water will just coordinate and sit there and look at it. That's what I think. Yeah, that's very cool. Thank you. Yeah. And this is why, I mean, if you think about a lot of these indium catalyzed reactions and organic reactions are done in water. They're actually, you can do them in water, so. I'm gonna ask a question too. Uh, that was yeah. fun. Thanks for a great talk. Um, so you had this hemi-labile or all the way labile phosphine derivative also, and where you're adding azide to initiate oh, the yeah, polymerization. Yeah. yeah. Not and, cationic but yeah. Right. Yeah. So I guess I was just wondering if the phosphine ever it reacts with the azide and does sort of Staudinger reaction type chemistry or, you know, whether you can imagine um, <clears throat> releasing N2 and forming a PN bond and doing some other organic chemistry at some point. Yeah. So this is where I was extremely careful to be like, you do not raise the temperature. You do this all done at room temperature, right? Because uh, so it's done at 80 degrees, sorry. But if he actually, I, I, I would probably think that if he does it for, um, you know, if if he pushes it a little bit more, he probably could get a starting your reaction, which is not mm -hmm. something that would be nice. So, so, and I mean, I would say there should be a disclaimer here because tetrabutyl ammonium azide is not a very nice reagent to use, right? So it's a, it's actually needs to have a safety. Um, um, but it's just, it's a very nice, the reason that he used it is because he was interested in the mechanism and you can use IR really beautifully with it. So that's, that's why he used it, I think. But yeah, so it, it does, it could potentially cause a problem. Um, he didn't see that in, a, in this system though. That's good. Yeah, I was wondering a little bit about the water that you were just talking about also, if that is acidified on indium at all. And yeah, well, this it, this was done in like yeah, ipsy yeah. fipsy pure water free stuff, right? So yeah. when, when, like we, we generally pretend that we don't use indium, we're, we're assuming we're using scandium instead of indium just to kind of be sure. It's just there are occasions where, you know, we, things happen, you know, when you normally, when you try to crystallize something and something goes wrong, I think that particular crystal was probably from an NMR tube or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, what we see is weirdly, there are occasions where these indium complexes are really stable and then we push it and we try to really push it as much as possible. These other reactions, we just pretend that it was scandium and went off from there, so. <laughs> that works, thanks. Parisa, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. You were talking about a bunch of ethers. I yes. think you went pretty fast over I did. it. I'm sorry. Yes. No, it's okay. But since we have time, a little bit of time for questions. Yeah. So I was curious. Um, yeah. Those what bunch of ethers? Yeah, the, those bunch of ethers. <laughs> okay. Especially the seven member ring and the yeah. six member ring. Yeah. Oxapane. Okay. So they all react very well. Yeah. So the reactivity basically it's similar for epoxides and the, uh, you know, 
why they were yeah gonna... they're they're quite reactive and it's it's what you know was really cool is this idea of using THF as this nice co-monomer in a very easy way, right? I mean, that, that for me, it's the THF that's the most interesting, actually. Um, it's also the least reactive if you think about it, right? It's, this has got the less, the least conversion, mm -hmm. but it still works, right? And yeah. to be able to use THF as a, as a nice co-monomer this way um, is actually really cool. Yeah, we, we get some uh, reactions with THF, but um, ours are not that controlled. Yeah, no, this was, this was a very neat way. And the, the, the fact, the, the thing that I didn't really get into is, as I mentioned, you can start tuning the reactivity a little bit, obviously not when you're doing THF reactions, but, but if you're doing other things, you can tune the reactivity with the solvent a little bit, um, um, as Hutan said. But again, you know, if you want it to be less reactive, you can use a little bit of a more donating solvent. Um, in this case, though, obviously the THF is the solvent. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Shiyun, do your last call. <laughs> well, so uh, is there any more questions from um, the professors or uh, students? So there's no questions, I guess. Uh, thank you very much for joining today's webinar. And um, yeah. Uh, yeah, anyone is invited to stay for the social hour, but uh, yeah. we especially- Yeah, we are having- the Center the, people, yeah. 